Um, okay, so as I was saying, I work for emailage, and we make determinations um, on transactional data to determine, to determine whether or not a transaction is potentially fraud. So say your IP address is coming out of Russia, your billing address is coming out of Dayton, Ohio, and your shipping address is going to um, Sacramento. Um, all of those things, depending on a lot of different information that goes into it, could determine whether or not that's fraud. We give a score back to the consumer. Um, my puppies, and I'm not necessarily going to blame them for why I'm less than prepared, but two great Dane puppies uh, take a lot of my free time. So um, let's get right into it. Function as a service. Um, it seems to be the biggest buzzword right now aside from, well, biggest uh, initialization, uh, or acronym, I guess, maybe, uh, aside from serverless. Um, it really means nothing. Serverless really means nothing, um, in, in my opinion. But uh, function as a service does mean a little something. However, most systems out there, you've got a lot of, uh, you've got to stand on ceremony and wrap a lot of functionality with HTTP handlers, and it sets a lot of expectations um, for what the function is going to do. Um, you can kind of look at HashiCorp Nomad as a function as a service platform. Uh, it's really scheduling and automating uh, containers and tasks. Uh, OpenFAS, um, believed by Alex Ellis, uh, is Kubernetes driven and allows you to um, execute functions as a service. And um, for anything that's on-prem or you have Kubernetes, um, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic system. So where does FreeBSD fit into all this? So most of the cloud providers, AWS, Azure, they all provide function as a service, but Linux is the primary operating system, and, and Docker and uh, Linux primitive, uh, primitives are derived to, or the containers from those are derived to create these. So FreeBSD, how does it fit? So we can start building these types of platforms with FreeBSD. Um, it's really not that difficult. We have jails that provide us our segmented execution environment. And we have the capabilities of ZFS to provide us clean file systems um, for all of that. We just need something to bind everything together for orchestration, really. So the, system, the components of the system um, are going to be jails, ZFS, and Go. Um, ZFS we're going to use for cloning and snapshotting uh, off of base systems. And we're going to use Go to build the system. Uh, Go we're going to get into later as to why I chose that. Um, and we're going, to we're going to drive the system via uh, HTTP and REST. We'll also include a uh, simple, I don't like to call it DHCP, but we'll include a simple DHCP server within the system to allocate um, IP addresses for our jails since um, we could play, you know, fast and loose and enable raw sockets and do all that stuff. We could get into, um, more uh, TCP stack virtualization, but that's going a little bit beyond the scope of actually um, what we're trying to accomplish here. So um, jails, I'm sure everybody knows what jails are, but if you don't, in a nutshell, j shell, jails provide operating system level virtualization um, through the use of file systems, has its own users, and can run multiple processes within. Um, features, uh, abstractions necessary to secure Execution environments for long and short-lived processes, um, simple and complex networking, like I mentioned, and they're very simple to use. Um, you can execute a jail and execute a process in a jail by just doing jail space dash C in a process name. It doesn't bind it to a file system, but at least uh, executes it segmented in the kernel. Um, you can then give a path where it would execute, though, and providing those parameters is, is fairly straightforward for jail 8. Um, Common uses for jails, um, I could be way off here, but my experience has shown that providing shell environments for, for users virtualizing a file system basically and giving somebody a shell, uh, web stacks and general network services, uh, long-lived uh, processes within those jails um, and managing them through configuration files and yeah, long-lived. So next, the next component is ZFS. With ZFS, we're gonna take advantage of Snapshots, uh, near instant cloning speeds, and just the fact that it's extremely fast. So with the snapshots, we have a read-only copy of data, uh, near instant creation, no disk space used unless data starts to change. What's going to happen is what we can do is 
bring down into our uh, into our data set um, a the PK, uh, base PKG uh, lib PKG uh, lib package and ports if we really wanted to, and we can we can uh, uh, decompress those and create the FreeBSD file system within a data set. We can then snapshot a very clean uh, FreeBSD file system and then clone from there uh, into our ephemeral ephemeral execution environments, which we'll see shortly. And these are these are the base this these base components of ZFS is what is really going to and jails is what's really going to drive the dynamic nature of how we can accomplish this. So same thing, well not same thing. We can write to clones, but uh, basically the same stuff for clones. And Go. Um, Go doesn't really make any kind of relevant impact on this at all, aside from it's the language I like and it's the one I'm most capable in uh, for the most part. Uh, this would actually, in my opinion, probably be possibly better suited for C, only because we'll, we'll get into it later, but um, you can embed V8, you can embed different interpreters, and then you can expose certain functionality um, for the functions that we execute to, to take advantage of. But in this case, we're just going to use Go. Um, it, there's only about 25 keywords in the language, so it's extremely small, um, easy to understand, simple concurrency, um, and a, a fairly extensive standard library. Um, and it's easy, easy to write, which means we can write code fairly quickly. So let's, uh, let's all bow our heads, pray to the demo gods, and make sure that my Wi-Fi is connected. And hopefully it will be. How many goats did you bring to sacrifice? What's that? How many goats did you bring to sacrifice? I bathed in blood last night. <laughs> that, that's extreme. I didn't do that. <laughs> all right, so. <laughs> yeah, only only about four or five of them. I was clearly nervous, so it was about four or five goats. All right, so we can interact with the system via curl. And what we're going to do is, so the, the whole basis behind the system is to be able to simply write a function, commit it to a, a repo, and then be done with it. No standing on ceremony of wrapping it in HTTP handlers, none of, none of that nonsense. We can simply write a function. So here we have an account, M. McLaughlin, or McLaughlin, I don't know. And there's a repository called Geohash. In there, there's a function called encode. So we provide it 100.1 and 80.9, and this is going to be a lat long. And we're just going to post this data into the system. And when we do, um, we get back the timestamp and the data. The data being the return value of what that Go function actually did. So if this was imported into a program, it would just be, you know, you know geohash.encode with two parameters, two float 64, 32, it doesn't matter, two float parameters. Here we're just, and the, the output of it would be the uh, JVCS blah, blah, blah string. Um, so how did that work? Let's get back to the slide see how that worked. So um, it's, if you want to, you can, you can post the data. Um, if you're interested in trying this out while I'm talking about this, um, if it, I'm going to try it again at the end so I'll know if somebody downs the server. This is, uh, this is purely POC, and I'm, I'm not invested in pushing a product. So there's lots of holes, but it's, it's more the idea. So uh, in any case, the, the basic uh, JSON payload is going to be the URL being the URL to a repository, and the call is going to be just a string version of what the function call is with whatever arguments it would be. Um, any errors that it would return will write out, and you'll get the error return data. So let's take a look. I'll leave this up for another second in case anybody is interested enough to do so. Um, That was, I changed the demo. Oh, well. OK, so what all just happened? We, uh, we as the caller, made a request, uh, HTTP post request, uh, to the API. The API made a determination of whether or not it had the Git repo uh, already cloned. Um, if it does, then it then d determines whether or not it has uh, a binary uh, already compiled for this function. If it does, then it takes that binary from wherever the binary is stored um, and clone, 
once it determines that, uh, we take a clone of our original clean snapshot, and we copy the binary in there, and then execute the jail, or we create the jail and execute that function within there, segmented off from the system. Um, if so, if it if it's if it happens that there is no git repo already cloned, we'll do a depth uh, a clone depth one because we clearly don't care about the rest of the history. And then we'll cache that in what's called a build jail. So we'll have the base system, a build jail, and the repos will exist in the build jail, and we can just continually use that code um, if, if necessary. So the execution that jail then runs, and the output of that is returned to the caller. Um, this generally takes on uncached repos and uncached binaries. This will generally take about 1.1 seconds to clone a repo and execute the function. On cached, it's probably about 500 milliseconds to actually accomplish sending it, sending the request, doing all the pinup of the jails, executing it, and returning to the caller. So the components of the system, example code. So a very simple C example of how we can just jail a process. Um, we're just giving it the jail API version, the path, um, jail name, host name, and we're going to Basically, at the bottom there, we're just going to list the contents of our, the root of our jail. Um, nothing, absolutely nothing special. Uh, Go doesn't look overly different. We still have a, a struct that we initialize with uh, the same basic values, and we call, um, well, this is specific my code, but jail.jail .jail with those options, and then we read the current directory being the root of that jail, and then we uh, output the files. Um, Right. I think I'm going just a little too fast. So IP management, as I mentioned, um, what we can do with IP management is we can take the security hit and allow raw sockets. We can do it more advanced networking and virtualize our TCP stack, uh, which is probably preferred and something that would be more production ready. Um, the other option is to write a, a simple IP allocator, which I've never done before, so I did in, in this example. Um, and it's all configuration driven. So through a simple JSON file, we can just provide uh, an IP range, and it'll calculate everything out. Uh, it'll calculate the number of IPs and then keep track of what gets assigned and uh, what's not assigned. So DHCP, the pros of doing it, well, we don't have to care. It just works. The cons is raw sockets. and likely more functionality than we need. We're not doing any kind of, anything more than just getting an IP address, really. Um, writing, writing an IP allocator, on the other hand, still, it just works. Pros is that you have to write an IP allocator. Um, and then we have to manage that pool within the allocator. Um, six and one half, I guess it's purely subjective at that point. Uh, the next component that we have is our API. So for this to really work, we need to be able to take, we need to receive uh, a JSON payload with the necessary information to trigger an actual function execution. And then we probably want the ability to kill any jails that may be um, living a little too long or maybe there's a stuck process. Uh, maybe we're waiting on a, a long timeout that's been configured for something somewhere. Um, so first and foremost, uh, personally, I like to provide health checks on all of my services and then probably provide some level of knowledge of that health check to provide back whether, whether or not it's actually healthy. Uh, obviously, 200 healthy, and generally I like to provide a git SHA in the health, um, health response only because then I know, you know what, what release has actually been deployed and I, I can build tooling around it. Next up, we have jail operations. We can get a list of all the jails, um, spe a specific jail, kill a jail, kill all the jails, if we're just in that type of mood. Um, we can get jail, so how, we're, how are we gonna get jail info? This is a bit tedious, um, and then again, I could be doing it completely wrong, and then at the end of this, somebody come please tell me how wrong I am. Um, so JLS is the easiest way to derive jail information in, that I've found. And the benefit of it is that it provides you a ton of data that is really useful. So if we provide JLS with the dash S uh, flag, excuse me, um, the output will look like this. And if we just 
you know, split on equal sign. We can, we can get that information and um, basically, you know, for lack of a better term, deserialize this into uh, a, a ghost struct to reason about the information and provide it back to the caller um, who's wanting to get that jail information. Um, so getting the jail information, if we run jail-c command equals sleep 30, um, and then we run JLS and, you know, grep for equals because there's some other stuff. Um, it'll, even if there's no data, it'll provide all fields back. It just won't provide an equal sign, so we can filter that. We can get all of this information fairly simply and then process from there. So removing jails is, is, is easy as just providing the uh, jail ID and the, and the dash R. So the reason for going through this, uh, you know, tediously is a lot of this would get wrapped into the API functionality of the HTTP delete request would come in and we would have some means of wrapping uh, jail dash R or the actual syscall to um, jail remove uh, with, with the necessary parameters. Um, so the biggest, the, the biggest component of this that makes a system like this potentially feasible um, if written with the intent of putting it into production would be, would be cash. We, we have to provide some level of cash to the caller, otherwise it, this, this would be just prohibitively slow. Um, so the caching strategies, we can cache the git repo in the build jail, uh, we can save the compiled binaries, and then a slightly more complicated one is just to save the known previous, previously seen requests. Complicated only in the sense that if prim um, we would only do that if parameters changed. We would then want to control whether or not we want a cached response or not a cached response and cache bust specifically on calls if we really wanted to, which is available in the JSON payload when posting in, we can just say cache bust true. Um, but we can provide caching at those three le uh, levels to provide um, speed. Uh, the system, the reference implementation I have um, has the first two. Um, I didn't care enough to create the third, but with the first two we can get uh, performance for simple functions at least that are just doing nonsense like calculating a hash, or simple hash at least, um, or returning a string or something like that in you know, 200 milliseconds uh, up to five to 600 milliseconds response times. So the, uh, the git cache, we're only gonna do a depth clone one. Um, I think this is mentioned further on in the talk, however, uh, an interesting feature that could be uh, derived from this is maybe producing or uh, providing a git hash in the, um, the request payload. And obviously you couldn't do a depth clone one, but if, the, if that commit hash existed, building a binary from uh, the, the hash of the provided, um, or from the provided hash, I should say. The other is the binary cache. Um, there's nothing novel about this approach. We're going to keep the binaries that have been built um, for the function, and we're just going to keep track of where they are. Um, all of them get a, um, a function. So the, the, when the call comes in, basically, the, um, the, it, as we saw in the previous uh, post request, the call is the actual function call with parameters. Um, we're going to take that and store that as the key, basically, so in case parameters change, we don't classify that as a, as a cache hit. Um, and then we're going to have um, the path to where that binary actually exists to then just go get it and copy it into our execution jail. So nothing novel. Uh, it's just accomplished through that simple struct right there. We just provide a mutex to protect the map, and the map contains the actual uh, information itself. A request cache, like I said, um, I don't have it, but it would store previous requests. Uh, it could it could be a system that could front on top of the API or that could front the API. It could be built into the system. It would we could probably go about that in a couple different ways that would yield interesting results regardless. All right. So one of the benefits that an approach like this can um, can have is now this is purely for Go functions. So we, I can safely say that there's not a whole lot of Go code out there by comparison to how much Java may be out there or how much C may be out there. But thinking about it from the perspective of your interaction with the functionality that you store in your repos can just be abstracted by transport being HTTP or if you wanted to get more um, 
uh, nuanced, you could go gRPC, or it doesn't really matter. But what we can do, what this has us do is now, we don't actually have to re-implement this algorithm in another language. We don't have to redo this logic uh, or business logic in all the different languages that this new architect came into your company. It's like, oh, we're going to use common Lisp. It's the future. I've actually heard that. And now you don't have to redo all of that stuff. What you can do is, um, oh, yeah, that's, that's a typo. So that's not actually go to, uh, <laughs> that would be C. Um, so what I, I, what I provided for just a purely for example is, um, I'm not gonna edit that now. So yeah, uh, C obviously, um, wrapper libraries. And all they're gonna do is just wrap the HTTP calls. So you can embed the functionality that may exist in your repo. Say you have a geo hash and you don't wanna re-implement it in C, it's in, it's in Go. Um, I'm sure, I don't know the implementation very well, but it may be non-trivial to re-implement. So we can just get the client struct and point it to the endpoint. This can all be configuration driven. Uh, the URL, the call itself, we execute the function with all that information. And the function would actually, there, we should be capturing some output right about here. But given the fact that I called this slide Go, I'm not surprised I and not capturing that output. But we would capture that output. Um, something tells me we're gonna have another little snafu in the next slide to uh, chuckle about. So we would get that back and we would, there, there's gonna be a data field like we saw in our JSON response. Uh, we can just get that data back. Now of course, that doesn't, this doesn't work in all situations where speed may be required introducing an HTTP call within some sort of critical, critical path would just be insane. But certain things we can get away with it. Uh, it's even simpler in Python. We can uh, just call the client, or get a new client and then call the function. Here we actually, um, I, I spent the, the long hours thinking about how to capture my data and I include the variable here. Um, we can then just get the information back and from this call we would then get, oh, that, that doesn't highlight when you double click it. Right, so you would just get this information back. Um, let's see. Oh, so it looks like I wrote the C1 twice. All right, so, what's that? Oh, I knew something would get highlighted. We will maintain ignoring the blue bar at the top, even though it's highlighted. Okay, so here's our root. What's that? Well, this is, this is the production ready code. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is what we, what QA is validated, does something. <laughs> so, same example, except here we have the res variable uh, actually capturing the output. Um, and the output uh, res struct would then just match whatever our JSON was. And we would print that out and Well, the, uh, that's just, there we go. Our output would be the same as we've seen everywhere else. Um, we would also have a timestamp in case there was any kind of relevance to that. Uh, let's see. And the simplest way is curl, which we've already seen. So we'll just kind of skip by that. So I started doing this. Um, so I run the, uh, the, the Go meetup in Phoenix, and there was, a, there was a talk put on by Liz Rice on how to build containers from scratch. And it was a matter of running all the syscalls necessary to construct a Linux container in Go and make a very, very simple system where it's like a single command, single container Docker, really. So like you could run a command, run something. It constructed the, the file system namespace, process namespace, or the file system process namespace and IP namespace and all that. I thought it was fantastic. So I did that at the, uh, at the meetup. So then one of the meetup uh, members, Josh Baker, decided to kind of make it a little bit more dynamic by taking that concept and making function calls like this. However, it was all derived from the URL uh, doing get requests. So I thought that was, that was clever. So then I was like, well, I don't really run Linux. I prefer FreeBSD uh, on my servers and, and obviously Mac. So I figured, how do I have FreeBSD eyes 
this concept. So it came down to jails as the execution environment and being able to extend out beyond GET requests and providing um, post data so you can control your execution environment just a little bit easier. Um, what, so as I'm building this system as just really experimental in POC, I started thinking about how could this be actually used in production and how could we, how could we horizontally scale a system like this given that we're, we're storing our, our Git clones uh, locally and we're storing our, our binaries locally. Um, so I started thinking, and how do, we, how do we use more than just Go? There's plenty of Go out there. It's, it's the most, one of the more popular languages now with Docker and Kubernetes, et cetera. Um, but the majority of logic and the majority of code does not exist in Go at the moment. Um, so how do we extend this to other languages to take advantage of all of that logic without having to re-implement or anything like that? So as I mentioned in the very beginning of the talk, this may be more well suited for uh, being written in C. We can embed uh, different interpreters um, very simply for Lua, JavaScript, like V8, and Python. Um, another idea was to basically create a multitude of jails that have different runtimes within them. So if you know you're running, excuse me, Python code, you can just get your 2.7 jail and uh, clone off of a 2.7 snapshot that's always clean. And you know, you know that file system never gets dirty or the interpreter never gets messed up through updates um, or, or 3.0. Um, same thing for maybe JavaScript. Maybe you have a node. Um, I don't know anything about node. I'm not going to mention it. Um, the other thing is clustering. How do we distribute out some shared state? Um, I think clustering in, in this case would likely be overkill. Uh, I know the hotness is to implement Raft on everything. Um, I don't really think this would qualify for that. However, some level of shared storage would be uh, pretty appropriate where we have maybe binaries being stored, uh, pads being stored in Dynamo, and uh, the binaries being stored in S3. Maybe repos we don't care as much about maybe, I don't know. Uh, or cloud provider integrations, like I just mentioned, uh, S3, Dynamo, RDS with Postgres, something along that line. Um, the most intriguing uh, potential, which, I, like I said, this is purely experimental in POC. I'm not going to really do anything with it, but I may spend the time to implement uh, scheduled scheduled function uh, execution. Um, there's a there's a it's very easy to be able to take uh, like cron spec and have execution of those functions at any given interval. Um, and it may be kind of nice to have in a distributed environment. The, uh, the only reason not to would be that you're knowledgeable about HashiCorp Nomad, because that basically does that, but for educational purposes. Um, let's see. So, conclusion. I, conclusion is I went through this way too fast. Uh, through the use of ephemeral jails, a simple API in ZFS, we can derive platforms that allow for the creation of dynamic workflows, further extending the capabilities of distributed code execution. Um, yeah, uh, that was probably a little long and involved to get that. So, in 25 minutes, which I was supposed to go for an hour, questions? Uh, I don't really. I have a V. Well, I have it in AWS, and I run some personal stuff through there. So uh, I've got some functions that'll do um, video encoding, uh, some functions that wrap FFmpeg, where I can just provide um, an S3 in and an S3 out path, and I can just hit the thing, and the function takes you know where where the base video is, and it outputs it to where I tell it to, and. Um, I've got somewhat of a build pipeline, but nothing, nothing really in production um, that I would, I, I wouldn't trust this in production. I, I, I built this way too fast, uh, and I was giddy while doing it. Like, holy crap, this, this kind of works. And I, I wouldn't trust anything in production with that mindset. So. Absolutely, yeah. In the uh, on the on the website where the sessions are, there's a link at the bottom that has this. But I, I can, it's. Uh, show it's a it's a fairly straightforward URL um, oh, that's quite large 
Uh, so Brian down slash Sky Island. Was there any other questions? You were first. To the code is like, um, how are you uh, taking a random uh, Go repo and then exposing the output of a function? Like, what's that bit look like? Is it just a template? Oh, and we we can we can get into the code if you guys want. Um, yeah, so. I was waiting for it. <laughs> All day long, right? Pretty much. <laughs> Are we ready to get going? Any number of others? All right, so uh, let's see if we can extend this out a little bit. So pretty much here in Handlers. Jails, that's not it. Function. So what we're doing is we're populating this template, uh, the template data struct. We got our package name, import path, and our call. And I'm sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm okay, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, so we populate our template data struct here with our import path, package name, and our call. And what we have is we take advantage of the Go standard libraries text template package where we can pass it this, um, we can pass the template engine our a pointer to the struct, and we pass it this um, well, template. And we can just dot reference the fields and they'll populate. So we're just really printing the standard out. And this is, so on each function execution, assuming that there's no uh, jail, uh, or I'm sorry, that there's no binary currently cached, um, the compilation process is stupid fast. So we can, get everything we need, compile the binary, copy it to the jail, and execute it within, um, like I said, up to 500, maybe 800, uncached 800, to a, a sec, 800 milliseconds to a second. And we can just uh, render this main.go and run a go build and compile that down for, for execution. So that, that's really the uh, how we're achieving that right there. So if the, so where's the arguments in this then? If, like, so we passed the, so, uh, the example, I think. I'm sorry, say again. You pass four bits in the uh, call. Yeah, so the call is simply just a string okay. uh, in our JSON payload. So that we, we're taking out all that, that level of um, logic that we would really need to care about. So we're just going for string representations. And uh, package name.call would be how it would be called in the code anyway. So we just populate everything right there. And any errors that this function may return, um, would just be printed to standard out, and we would receive it in our JSON payload. So, do, do you have bugs in the function? How does that show up when you make the call? It'll show up as um, it'll show up as uh, error output. The same error output that you return in your function, uh, you'll see that as you're in your response in your JSON response. If there's compilation errors, then you wouldn't see, you would get like a, you'd get a 500 back uh, on the API. You wouldn't see any, any response at that point. Um, and there's logging in here. Um, so I'm not leaking the actual errors out to the API. The API would just spit out a five, so, uh, a five XX of some sort. I, I, can, I can look if anyone's really interested, but the logger would handle all that, the JSON logger out, output. Absolutely. Are you, are you compiling on post or only on call if the cache misses? If it's cache miss, I'm compiling. Uh, if it's cache miss, I'm compiling to then respond to the caller. Okay. So you don't compile when I post my new function. Hey, I've got a new function. This is what I want to run eventually. <laughs> There's no eventual nature. It's when you post in, the expectation is that you get a response on that request. At some sure, point. But it's not compiled until you actually. But the post is the user. The post, yeah. Um, so you've got your repo that you've committed some code to. It just lives there happy, sitting there at $7 a month in GitHub, waiting for it to go to probably 400 a month at this point, maybe. And it just sits there happy. And then when you say, when you tell the system to go and post it, it goes against it and then compiles, assuming it hadn't seen it before.
basically, yeah, that's it. You, you don't have any like content of like HTTP or No, none of that. I wanted to keep it as dead simple as possible, seeing as how most of the systems out there require stuff like that, or maybe not require, but provide you that level of complexity to add, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like, I don't have anything against OpenFOS. I think it's fantastic and that's production ready. Uh, nothing against Lambda or Azure Functions. They're all great, but I wanted something FreeBSD based. I wanted I wanted this this whole idea and concept wrapped in a jail and all that. Whether it gets used. Could you go back to one of your earlier slides? It's got a bunch of squares showing the flow. the call flow. Yeah, sure. I'm just trying to get a sense of what I'm really interpreting this right. You I may not have described it correctly. Also, you run a curl. Yes. That single request spins up a jail, a ZFS snapshot, downloads code, co compiles it, passes what I sent through curl, and then spits something back, and then tears all that back down. Yes. Okay. So, are you exploring now the, the, the ability that you can use that jail? The execution jails, no. They are purely. They come up, they get a binary put in them, and then they execute, and then they go away. There is a couple of reusable jails in the system. So if you download, if you do clone the system and look at it, if you provide um, Sky, if you do Sky Island dash C with a JSON config file, what the dash I'll do is initialize the system, and what that's going to do is it's going to download um, the FreeBSD release that you've configured in your configuration, and it'll extract all of that out. It'll create a release jail. It'll snapshot that clone, create a build jail. Your build jail is where Go would, in this case, is where Go gets installed, um, where Go path and all the, the Go stuff gets configured, and that's where all the code then gets placed. That original uh, base jail, that, um, where the, the, the release jail, we'll call it, um, any executions that come in are then just cloned from the snapshot that was made from there. So we, we could definitely figure out ways to uh, to reuse jails for certain. Do you have any details on what security that you have on your jail? So like the function just yeah. access. So you know, is, it, is it a curl that like if I just pointed out a random GitHub repo that has untrusted code on it? Oh, this is a security nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Oh sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if you want to burn the world down, spin this up. <laughs> um, yeah, let's take a look at that. We, well, I, there is a little bit of security there. Um, and uh, come on, learn how to computer. So what file are we in? Function. So let's. OK, so when we're building, so right now, I built, um, this was built before. So Go has lots of syscall coverage for Linux and a number of uh, platforms. Uh, as well as FreeBSD. However, it does not provide uh, syscall coverage for jail, jail set, jail remove, et cetera, jail attach. I did write a library for that. It's not great, but I haven't integrated it into this. Likely won't. But we're just doing a shell exec. So through configuration, um, we can give a build, uh, well, a jail timeout. This is a timeout on our build jail. This is the longest that will allow a build of code to run before we say no and respond with a 500 or, or something else. Um, and then we're, uh, by default, we're going to just disable networking unless um, we have an, an IP request in our, um, uh, in our post data. And then I think here, uh, so timeout isn't necessarily a security feature, even though it if somebody really wanted to stretch it, you could you could call it that. Um, here we have we can through con the configuration file that's passed in execution, we can uh, control how many jails underneath each jail get created, and all of the different uh, parameters that you can pass to jail set. Um, all the uh, in the C code, what is it? The I O um, I O V E C um, calls. You can you can provide all the max children. There, there's a whole list of them. If you look up uh, jail two. Uh, or Jelly provides you all that information, um, but right now, currently, it's it's only we're, we're limiting that. Uh, so that that's the extent of the, um, and it has to run as root. So, 
which we, we, we could do that right, but this currently has to run as root. <laughs> Well, that is fantastic. Yeah. That was. Uh, it took me a while to dig that out. I always have to struggle with Lipso arguments, but yeah, I was I was going through and I was looking like uh, I don't yeah. care enough. I'm just going to split on equals. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's that that would that would have saved me some time. <laughs> uh, any other questions or uh, suggestions? Current state, no, but that is a fantastic, fantastic direction that, that, that this could go. Given the fact that it's GitHub, not GitHub, I shouldn't say that. Given the fact that it's Git driven on the underside, any of the Git features um, you, you can take advantage of and cache any, anywhere along those lines and, and do all that stuff, which if I had to productionalize this, I'd first rewrite it and second, in, include uh, features like that. Oh, that would have solved half the other problems that I mentioned before. Yeah, that would be it. That would be that would. Be. Okay, yeah, let's definitely talk about that afterwards. <laughs> that would be a really cool idea. Uh, I think you had yeah. one. Let's say you call the function and different users. How do you work for that one? Everyone is creating the same jail, calling the same. So currently in the code base, um, there's no intelligence wrapped around. Um, there's no intelligence to prevent the duplication of the same exact jail. So if you and I execute the exact same function at the same time, the, the way Go HTTP handlers work is we're, we have segmented execution in our, own, in our own routines. However, we are getting, the system will build the exact same jail. Um, there, there could be somewhat of a race in the sense that mine may be faster than yours or yours or vice versa. Um, if one of them hasn't been seen before and the compilation process is completed, I may end up pulling from cache where you may not or vice versa. But yeah, it's, it's um, not efficient in that regard. <laughs> but that's, I never thought about doing that. That makes sense though. Any other, any other questions? Have you ever, do you hit this with heavy load? Um, yeah, just, just messing around. Um, I don't remember the, the raw numbers off the top of my head, but I think this is running on like a, a, a T2 instance or, or maybe an M4. It doesn't matter. It's not a very powerful instance running on Amazon, and I hit that endpoint um, with a bunch of requests. And there started to be, it started, performance started to noticeably degrade around I want to say like 12 or 15, I'll say, I'll say 12, so I'm not over, sounding overly hopeful. Uh, 12,000 requests a second. It, it started, started to, the norm was about, you know, on, on cache hits was anywhere from 300 to 500 milliseconds. Uh, around 12,000 upwards of that, uh, it started going up to like one second on, on cached uh, binaries. So it's, it, it, a lot of work can be done to make it more performant, without a doubt. Anybody else? Okay. Well, hijacks, um, so I screwed up on the schedule later today. Where there is a BOF on Go, um, and we can talk a bit more about some of the both the compilation times um, and just kind of general performance of, of Go. Um, so, yeah. Actually, that's a good point. This this would actually be faster now since 1.10, uh, with the fact that they have build cache. So depending on if it's seen it before, there's a build cache, and that would be that much faster as well. Now that you, you mentioned Go Build, but so if I understand correctly, you were cloning the build jail. No, so um, so we have we have 
at the very beginning, after, after quote unquote initialization, we have a release jail. So we unpack our base, lib, and ports, or whatever. Um, all all the, the packages that create the FreeBSD, that lay out the file system into its, into its own um, data set. And from there, we create the build jail, and it just happily builds code. And then whenever there's an execution, we clone from the release jail, the clean, fresh operating system, and we put the binary into that uh, execute and then kill off that uh, execution jail. Uh, yeah, the execution jail uh, just purely acts as, as, as yeah, a sandbox to prevent any nefarious code inside that binary from doing any harm to the system itself. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not running anything. Yeah. It's an point. Yep. And that you provide that with this, within the syscall or the command line. I don't think you need libc because it's statically the the binary is statically compiled. Does it? That's, so if I was to actually spend time making this into something, that would be one of the things I would do is make a slim down. So really, to, to, your, to your point, yeah, I don't need a full-on operating system, file system layout at all. I just need the necessary things for the, for the binary to execute, and that would be slash dev and the other things mentioned. But yeah, that could be slimmed down, and that would actually make um, distributing those execution environments or those base environments a lot simpler for like ZFS sends and receives to move those uh, the, those um, file systems around as well. So uh, right now uh, it would just be far too bloated for any kind of distribution at that at that point. Yeah, this is a well suited for kind of this is more like the um, IOPA jail, maybe one running jails, much the same problems we have in these snapshot Yeah, oh yeah. In, from a single node perspective, yeah, this it just clones. It's fine. It's fast. It's it's just going. But um, since it's near instant cloning from the snapshot, we we could probably take a millisecond off by shrinking it down because it's it's not really doing much. Oh, in terms of initialization, yeah, yeah. But initialization is just once upon installation, but. Mm -hmm. Sure, but that would be, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, I don't necessarily know if I went to scale this horizontally if I would actually distribute the ZFS file systems, though. I may just distribute the binaries themselves into an S3, an object store, or um, the pa their paths to Dynamo, or, or something along those lines to strip it down that much easier and take advantage of the distributed tools out there. But if you had to, um, scale this in such a way that distributing the file systems themselves was the route you had to take, then yeah, getting them as as insanely small as humanly possible would be absolutely the route to go. And this is less about your setup, but more about FreeBSD. Are there number bounds to the number of simultaneous jails and snapshots that created? There is, and I remember seeing I remember seeing it in the code the kernel code as I was perusing through, but I don't remember. Does anybody know that? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. The number of jails. Yeah. In terms of snapshots? large. Snapshots, I don't know. So it would be the number of simultaneous jails. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So a single node, yeah. And that's one thing you would have to take into consideration is how many, how many jails or how many jails can you have running concurrently before the system falls over or there's too much latency and queuing waiting for requests to be satisfied. So. And then snapshots, that's just a function of how many times you created it, destroyed the file set, and it's a data set. It just gets increasingly slow with the indirect blocks on the CFS, but there's really no here. In here, there's no limit there. That's
that I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't dig that deep into ZFS. <laughs> Anybody else? Cool. Well, thank you for uh, listening and uh, taking the time to ask the questions. It's uh, definitely been nice. Thank you. Thank you.